Hi everyone, this is a video for Act 2, Scene 3 of Romeo and Juliet. In this scene, um, Romeo is visiting Friar Lawrence in his cell in the area where he lives in order to beg Friar Lawrence for his help and assistance in marrying Juliet. Um, we begin with Friar Lawrence alone in this scene. Um, this introduces us to, to a lot of the kind of um, spiritual ideas around the friar and his beliefs about um, love and unity and ending the feud. Um, but equally, it also reminds us about his role as an apothecary. An apothecary is somebody who prepared and sold medicines and drugs. And as we know that, obviously, um, Romeo and Juliet will die... Um, later on there's a lot of foreshadowing here about that kind of role of the apothecary in um, creating those drugs and um, those um, powerful uh, medicines so it begins here with Friar Lawrence on his own we'll just read a little bit of this section first and then we'll analyze and annotate some of the bits that I've pointed out here the grey-eyed morn smiles on the frowning night, checkering the eastern clouds with streaks of light, and fleckled darkness like a drunkard reels from forth day's path and titan's fiery wheels. Now ere the sun advances burning eye, the day to cheer, and night's dank dew to dry. Now, we'll carry on reading the section in a moment, but you'll notice some of these words that I've highlighted here. Grey-eyed, clouds, night, all things that are associated with darkness. And in this contrast, there's always this binary opposition, often through Romeo and Juliet, between that light and dark imagery. And you can see words like light and sun. And that light and darkness imagery is reminding us of that perpetual battle between good and evil, love and hate, that stems through the text. He continues this speech over the page. Um, I must upfill this osier cage of ours with baleful weeds and precious juiced flowers. So he's talking about the pieces that he's collecting for his work as an apothecary, the, the, the preparation of those medicines and those herbs. Uh, this earth that nature's mother is her tomb. What is her burying grave that is her womb? Now, this is interesting. This is a metaphor here. And there's this imagery of birth and fertility, um, womb, nature's mother. But we've also got this idea of the tomb, the burying grave, and that's reminding us of the cycle of life, but also potentially the friar's role in bringing somebody's life to an end, essentially with these herbs and medicines that he later gives to Romeo and Juliet. And so it reminds us of the inevitability of life and death, but also um, that potential for danger in the um, friar's intervention. And from her womb, children of divers kind, we sucking on her natural bosom find, many for many virtues excellent, none but some, and yet all different. O oh, mickle is the powerful grace that lies in plants, herbs, stones, and their true qualities, for naught so vile that on the earth doth live, but to the earth some special good doth give, nor aught so good but strained from that fair use, revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice being misapplied and vice sometime by action dignified. So in that section there, he's talking about the potential power that these herbs and these plants um, and these drugs uh, and medicines that, he, that he's preparing could potentially have, but also how dangerous they can be in the wrong hands. At this moment, Romeo enters. The friar continues his speech. And this is the quotation that I think is a really good introduction to that idea of the role of the friar as the apothecary, the provider of that poison, of that medicine. He says, within the infant rind of this weak flower, poison hath residence and medicine power. So it introduces that theme of the priest as the apothecary, the power of the poison and the medicine, and foreshadows the idea that this medicine could be used for something dangerous in future. For this being smelt with that part cheers each part. Being tasted stays all senses with the heart. Two such opposed kings encamp them still, in man as well as herbs, grace and rude will. And where the worser is predominant, full soon the canker death eats up that plant. Romeo says, Good morrow, father. Benezicite, what early tongue so sweet saluteth me? Young son, it argues a distempered head, so soon to bid good morrow to thy bed. Care keeps his watch in every old man's eye, and where care lodges, sleep will never lie. So he's saying, my goodness, why are you awake at this hour? Something must be troubling you, or keeping you from your bed. 
He says, where unbruised youth with unstuffed brain doth couch his limbs, their golden sleep doth reign. I like this quotation here, this unbruised youth and unstuffed brain. The friar is referencing Romeo's youthful innocence and perhaps suggesting that he's lost some of that innocence and this is the reason why he can no longer sleep. Something in terms of that experience he's having, that, that growth to adulthood is preventing him from his sleep. And the friar is saying he wants to know what it is that's keeping Romeo from his sleep. Uh, therefore thou earliness doth, doth me assure thou art uproused with some distemperature. So he's saying, you know, the fact that you're awake tells me that there's something wrong here with you, Romeo. What, what's the matter? Or if not so, then here I hit it right. Our Romeo hath not been in bed tonight. The last is true, the sweeter rest was mine. God pardon sin, wast thou with Rosaline? With Rosaline, my ghostly father, no. I have forgot that name and that name's woe. So he's forgotten Rosaline and the pain that she caused him. That's my good son. But what? Ha where hast thou been then? I'll tell thee ere thou think that... I I'll tell thee ere thou ask it me again. I have been feasting with mine enemy. Where well, on one sudden one hath wounded me. That's by me wounded both our remedies within thy help and holy psychic lies. So let's just pause and have a look at this. So he says, I'll tell you where I've been since you've asked me twice. I've been feasting with my enemy. Now, literally, he means I've been at the Capulet party. I've been at the house of my enemy having a feast. But symbolically, it means something else. Remember, symbolism is where something has a double meaning. It means something deeper than what is literally said. This feasting word in particular... This verb, present participle verb, shows his overpowering love for Juliet and his desire to consume and be one with her, his, his desire to be united with her. So it's got a double meaning, that line there. And then he talks about the pain of love again. He says, she has wounded me and that's by me wounded. So I've wounded her and she's wounded me. We've both been pierced by this arrow of love for one another. Um, and he says, both our remedies within your help lie. So he's basically saying the pain of their unrequited, of, of their kind of forbidden love, the pain of the idea that they love one another but can't be together, could be remedied by the friar's intervention. So he's begging him for his help to take away the pain of that forbidden love to help them be together. He says, I bear no hatred, blessed man, for lo, my intercession likewise steads my foe. Be plain, good son, and homely in thy drift. Riddling confession finds but riddling shrift. So he's basically saying, come on, speak plainly. Be, be clear with me. What, what are you trying to tell me? Um, Romeo says, then plainly know my heart's dear love is set on the fair daughter of rich Capulet. As mine on hers, so hers is on mine. And all combined, save what thou must combine. By holy marriage, when and where and how we met, we wooed and made exchange of vow. I'll tell thee as we pass, but this I pray, that thou consent to marry us today. So this line here where he says, when and where and how we met, we wooed and made exchange of vow. This, reference that makes, this makes reference to the holy vow and promise of marriage, the idea that he's taking this seriously, but also reminds us here that we've got this listing and this rhyming, or this rhyming couplet shows the finality and certainty of their love. See how the words how and vow rhyme. It's as though he's really serious about this love for Juliet and he wants that to come across to the friar. If we continue over the page... Sorry. Okay. And the friar says, Holy St. Francis, what change is here? Is Rosaline that thou didst love so dear? So soon forsaken, young men's love then lies, not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. So he's saying here, he's questioning um, the validity of Romeo's love. He's questioning Romeo's maturity and his true intentions. Basically, he's talking here, you look at the word eyes, he says, love doesn't lie in the heart, it lies in the eyes. Remember, we used that term synexarchy a while ago. Um, synexarchy is where um, part of something represents the whole of it. And so here, the eyes represents the superficial nature of love, the fact that he only loves what he sees. It's not a real true love, it's almost lust. 
and he kind of just fancies her. He's kind of willing Romeo to be rational. Come on, you're in love with another girl again. Um, and here, you see I've written the absence of parental guidance. The friar is almost like a substitute father figure for Romeo. And you'll notice there's not a lot of closeness with his own father. And the friar becomes his kind of advisor and confidant. So he's willing Romeo to be serious about this. And as it goes on here, you can see references to the fickle that just means changeable. It alters all the time. Nature of Romeo's love. So when uh, the friar says here, um, Jesu Maria, what a deal of brine hath washed thy sallow cheeks for Rosaline. So we're saying, how many tears did you um, shed for that girl you said you loved before? How much salt water thrown away in waste to season love that of it doth not taste? The sun not yet thy sighs from heaven clears, thy old groans yet ringing in mine ancient ears. So he's saying those cries and those groans and that moaning you were doing about Rosaline, I can still almost hear it. How can you possibly have changed this quickly? Lo, here upon thy cheek the stain doth sit of an old tear that is not washed off yet. So even your tears for Rosaline is still on your cheeks and you're talking about another woman here. Um... If e'er thou wast thyself and these woes thine, thou and these woes were all for Rosaline, and art thou changed? Pronounce this sentence then. Women may fall when there's no strength in men. Thou chides me oft for loving Rosaline, for doting, not loving pupil mine. So Friar even says, this is not love. I'm convinced this is not love. Show me otherwise. And bades me bury love. So would you rather I just bury love? Not in a grave to lay one in, another out to have. I pray thee, chide me not. Her I love now, doth grace for grace and love for love allow. The other did not so. Oh, she knew well, thy love did breathe by rote that could not spell. But come, young waverer, come go with me. In one respect, I'll thy assistant be. For this alliance may so happy prove to turn your household rancour to pure love. So... The friar is not convinced that this is true love, but the reason why he consents to help is because he sees this opportunity to overcome the feud. And rancor just means like hatred, to change your household's hatred to pure love. The friar sees an opportunity to overcome the feud. He sees an opportunity for peace. And so rather than helping Romeo because he believes that he genuinely is in love with this woman, he sees a glimmer of hope that the feud between the two families could be ended and he agrees to help. Romeo says, oh, let us hence, I stand on sudden haste. So he wants to be hasty, but the friar warns him about that haste and he says, wisely and slow, they stumble that run fast. And that's foreshadowing again. The friar is warning Romeo of the dangers of moving too quickly with this. And of course, we know that short courtship over five days between the meeting and dying shows us the danger of that haste that Romeo employs here. Okay, great, we'll stop there, well done.